All right, normal distribution. So we talked previously about a normal distribution. Remember that a normal distribution is a certain shape, a representation of expression of data. And a normal distribution is called normal because it's basically normal. It's a typical distribution. It's a common distribution. It's the common way that a lot of data are represented in the real world, particularly physiological data or things that we see in nature, things that occur in nature. And the reason that we need to spend a fair bit of time talking about a normal distribution is that it's actually a really useful thing to us and it's very fundamental to the process that we go through for inferential statistical testing. And the reason for that is because it has such a specific shape, and that shape is this, because it has such a specific shape, if a variable is normally distributed, then we actually have a lot of information about that variable, and in particular about the likelihood of certain scores on that variable. So what I mean by that is if a variable is normally distributed, by which I mean that it that the majority of scores are around the mean in the middle, the mean being the middle score, the average score. And there's fewer scores down the left-hand side, which is the bottom tail. And there's fewer scores up the right-hand side, which is the top tail, which means that the majority of scores are distributed around the middle and the extreme scores down the very left or down up the very right, those extreme scores are unlikely or un are un uncommon what that means is that we can get a really good sense if we know any particular score, how likely it is to occur and how different it is from the other scores. So the fact that this distribution is symmetrical, the fact that the right hand side looks the same as the left hand side, means that 50% of our data are below the mean, are underneath the mean, and 50% of our data are above the mean. And what that means is that if we were to pick any particular one score from a population, there's a 50% chance or a 50% likelihood that that one score will be above the mean and a 50% likelihood that that one score will be below the mean. So understanding the normal distribution gives us a lot of information about how likely certain scores are to occur, how likely certain scores are um, on that particular variable. And just beyond that simple 50% above, 50% below, we can actually break down the normal distribution into more fine specific areas underneath the normal curve. And that's what this graph represents. This graph is showing you what percentage of scores fall in certain areas underneath this normal curve. And what you see on the x-axis down the bottom of the graph here, on this scale, the horizontal scale, is you can see for this particular distribution, we have a mean score of zero, that's the score in the middle there, and we have standard deviations of scores above the mean and below the mean. And remember, standard deviations are representing the variability or the range of scores, how much dispersion there is of the scores or how wide the spread of scores are. And in this particular normal distribution, we have an understanding of what percentage of scores falls within any particular range of scores around the mean. So what that means is that for if we have our distribution with a mean score of zero, that between zero and half of one standard deviation above the mean, we have 19% of our scores between zero and half a standard deviation below the mean, we also have 19% of scores. So we have almost 40% of scores, half a standard deviation above the mean to half a standard deviation below the mean. Similarly, between half and one standard deviation above the mean, we've got another 15% of scores and similarly below the mean. So what this graph is representing is what percentage of scores fall within each set of standard deviations above and below the mean. And because we have an understanding of what a normal distribution looks like, because we understand how the scores are spread around the mean in a normal distribution, what we can then have an understanding of is what proportion of people in our population fall into any particular part of this distribution.
And because we know that, we can then work out how likely it is that any particular person randomly selected from our population has any particular score. So that's really important. I'm going to say that again. So because we have an understanding of how the scores are distributed, how they're spread out around the mean, based on that understanding, based on understanding the normal distribution, we then know what proportion of our population falls into any particular part of the distribution. And that's represented by all the percentages in this particular graph. Therefore, we can work out how likely it is, what the probability is, that any particular person who's randomly selected from our population can have any particular score. And that theory, that process is called the empirical rule. And that's a really important concept for us because it helps us understand to be able to compare scores. And we'll talk about that in a second but it also gives us information to do with our inferential statistical testing, which we'll get to in the second part of the lecture today. So just to summarize, knowing information about the spread of scores, we know that 68% of scores fall within plus and minus one standard deviation of the mean. So from positive one to negative one, we have 68% of scores. We know that 95% of scores fall within plus and minus two standard deviations of the mean. So from positive two to negative two, we have 95% of scores. And we know that 99.8% of scores fall within plus and minus three standard deviations of the mean. So any person getting a particular score greater than three standard deviations above the mean or three standard deviations below the mean is very, very unlikely. And that particular shape of that curve is called a probability density function. The density is just representing how many scores we have in certain parts of that graph. So to give you an example of why this might be practically useful, let's talk about intelligence. So intelligence, IQ, cognitive intelligence, is something that psychologists um, and clinicians more broadly know a lot about because it's something that's been studied a whole lot. And what we know is that if we use standardized measures of intelligence, standardized tests to measure intelligence, that our population average intelligence score has a score of 100. So the average intelligence in the population measured using one of these standardized scores is a score of 100. That's the average score. And we know that, that intelligence scores also have a standard deviation of 15. So in our population, our mean intelligence score, IQ score, is 100. And the standard deviation, the average amount of variation around that mean, is 15. And having that information, we can actually use that knowledge then to see how unusual or how typical any individual person's IQ is by comparing it to what we know about the shape of the distribution. So let's say that we have one particular person, that person is called Joe, and Joe has an IQ of 115. So Joe's IQ score is 115, and we know that that IQ score is one standard deviation above the mean because it's 15 points above the mean of 100. And 15 points is our standard deviation score. So by knowing that Joe has an IQ of 100, we know that that particular IQ score goes about there on our graph. And therefore, we can use that information to see what proportion of people have an IQ above Joe's and what proportion of people have an IQ below Joe's. And expressing any particular score in a standardized way is called calculating a Z-score. And a Z-score or a Z-score um, is just a way of expressing a particular score, a particular number, in a standardised unit of measurement. So Z-scores, Z-scores, they're standardised scores, and what they represent is the difference between a particular score, a particular value, and the mean score on that variable, and it's expressed in standard deviation units. And calculating a Z-score was actually just what I did on the previous slide by saying that Joe's IQ was one standard deviation above the mean. Z-scores, Z-scores can be either positive or negative numbers. And because they're expressed in standard deviation units, 
if somebody has a certain z-score of zero, that means that they are smack bang right on the mean. A z-score of zero means this person has an absolute exact mean score on this particular variable compared to our population. So this is the formal formula for calculating z-scores, z-scores. It's probably going to irritate you that I keep alternating between the two and saying that. Um, and this is the formula up the top there. The formula here is just the individual score, the one single score, minus the overall mean score, divided by the standard deviation. So if we were to calculate a z-score, a z-score for Joe's particular score, that would be Joe's score of 115, minus the overall population mean of 100, divided by 15, which gives us 15 over 15, which gives us a score of 1. So Joe has a z-score of 1, and that represents the fact that she is one standard deviation above the mean on intelligence. And we can also use that information to say that 15.9% of people have higher IQ scores than what Joe has. And we're getting that information just by looking at what proportion of people or what percentage of people have certain scores under the normal distribution, using that information about the normal distribution. So z-scores can be really useful if we want to compare scores that are on different scales. So if I used one measure of IQ and said that a person had an IQ score of 100, and I used a different measure of IQ and said that this person had a score of 10, I can't necessarily compare those two scores because they're on different scales. I need to understand what the 100 is out of to understand if that's a high score or a low score or an average score. So calculating z-scores is actually quite a common thing, particularly for psychologists, particularly for clinical psychologists to do, because it allows us to compare scores between people and between different kinds of tests or different kinds of variables that we're measuring, just by using that formula there, score minus mean over standard deviation. So for example, let's say that we had a reading test which was out of 10 and a maths test out of 25. The score on the reading test, say, say a person gets a score of 6 out of 10, and then a, that same person gets a score of 10 out of 25, I can't compare the 6 on the reading test with the 10 on the maths test because they're on different scales. They're on different measurement scales. So I could use the z-score calculation to be able to compare them so that they're both expressed in standard deviation units so that I can directly compare them in terms of how high versus low either of those particular scores are. Okay, so the most important thing to take out of what we were just talking about in terms of going forward into this next section is that if a certain variable is normally distributed, that gives us a lot of information about how unusual a particular score is. If we have a particular score, we can compare it to what we know about the distribution of these scores under the normal distribution. And therefore, we can have a lot of information about how unusual or how unlikely it is for that score to arrive. So that leads us on in a slightly indirect way to talk about sampling distribution. So we can use that same logic that we just use for the z-score when we're doing research studies. But if instead, instead of comparing one particular individual to a population mean, which is what we just did with Joe's IQ score, we can use this knowledge to compare a sample to a wider population. And that's what this sampling distribution stuff is talking about. So what you can see in the graph on the left-hand side here is a representation of a population average score, which is a population score of three. You can see at the top there, mu equals three. And if we were to randomly select samples of four people at a time from our population, then each of those samples would have a sample mean. So you can see on the left-hand side there, the first sample has a mean score of three. The second sample has a mean score of two. The third sample has a mean score of four, etc., etc. So each of these samples, samples taken from the population, is going to have a sample mean score. And that mean score is going to be not identical to the population mean score. And the reason for that is just because of sampling variability, that the individual people that we select from our population, because there is variation within the population, there's going to be variation across each of the individual sample means.
if we were to do uh, to undertake that process, so to get each individual sample and plot their mean scores, then what we would find is that the distribution of sample means would be normal, would be normally distributed. And that's what the right hand side graph is showing here. That if we were to take a whole lot of samples from a wider population, the distribution of those sample means will be normal. And the bigger the sample sizes, the bigger the number of observations in each individual sample, the more likely the distribution of sample means will be normal. So what you can see here in the graph is that the distribution of our sample means has a mean score of three, which is the same as our population mean score. And the distribution of sample means has a certain standard deviation and that standard deviation is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. This distribution here is called the sampling distribution. And that is called, the, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is called the standard error. And the standard error is an important concept for us going forward. And we have a certain formula for that, which I'll show you in a second. So take my message from this slide is that if we have information about a population mean score, and we take a whole lot of samples from that population, then each of the sample mean scores will be normally distributed. Sorry, the distribution of the total of the sample mean scores will be normal. And the mean of our sampling distribution will be the same as the mean of our population, the mean score in the population. And that process, that theory of those principles is actually called the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem tells us that that distribution of sample means will be approximately normal, will take that normal shape, and that the means of the sample mean will be the same as the mean of the population, the mean score in the population. And the standard deviation of sample means, we can represent by calling it the standard error. So if you see information about a standard error, standard error SE is the standard deviation of the sample means. And that has a certain formula, which is this. So the standard error equals the standard deviation, sigma here, divided by the square root of the sample size. So we can calculate a standard error for each individual set of data. And that standard error is the standard deviation of the data divided by the square root of the sample size, the number of observations that make up that data set. And that's a really important process because that essentially forms the basis of how we do our inferential testing.